Welcome to another edition of the Future Questions Show, the part of my channel where I ask and answer questions about the future. Since the last time we did this, loads of you have asked me questions, all these questions in fact, and so thanks to all of you who've, who've asked all of these. Um, I won't be able to answer all of them, but um, I'll get through as many as I can and I'll do it in different categories. Right, the first category we've got is future energy. And the first question we had came from uh, Thomas Koza, who wants to know more about nuclear fusion. I would like to know more about the potentials of nuclear fusion energy, the ITER, or could this be the solution to the energy crisis? Well, for those of you not in the know, the ITER is the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. It's being built in southern France. It's being funded by countries from all around the world. And the idea is to build a nuclear fusion uh, demonstration reactor, which will go into operation in the 2030s, produce power for literally a few seconds, and then after that they plan to build a full thermonuclear um, fusion reactor um, sometime in the, in the 2040s. It, it, it might start operation, so long-term um, activity. Do I think this will be the answer to our energy needs? Well, Yes and no. I, I think nuclear fusion will eventually happen. We will find this way of creating cleaner nuclear power. However, the amount of energy which will go in to do it will be so great that the energy return on these um, systems will be quite low and therefore um, we'll have to start using energy a lot more conservatively. That leads us on to another question which was raised by uh, Tony Beer. Um, Tony says that sometimes he encounters people who insist the future will be full of abundance and, and all plentiful and we won't have to change our ways, etc., due to things like solar power. And he notes that um, in my book, well done for um, mentioning the book there, Tony, um, I argue against this because of the EROI on solar power being, being so low. Now, EROI is the energy return on investment from a power source. So you put so much energy into something to get so much out. With oil, you put a very small amount of energy in to get a lot out. As I've just talked about, nuclear fusion could be a problem. We put lots of energy in to get relatively little out. Um, and solar power is the same. Um, solar power is an incredible technology, um, but we have to make the cells, they use materials, they have a relatively limited life, uh, and therefore the energy return on them will, will be relatively low. And so, Yes, I think solar is a critical part of our future, um, but the problem we face is at the moment, via fossil fuels, we are burning up something like a million years of stored photosynthesis every year, and there isn't a technology out there which can match that in, in terms of returns. So um, solar is part of the answer, nuclear fusion is part of the answer, um, but we'll still have to massively reduce our energy requirement to, to increase our energy efficiency. Another question about um, energy came from that fantastic um, YouTube um, name here, the Erudite Polymath, who asked, in my opinion, are global corporations preventing or resisting alternative energy production, things like solar and wind, tidal, etc., uh, because of their vested interest in, in, in oil? And well, absolutely, I'm, I'm sure they are. But they're not necessarily doing, I don't think, because they're trying just to protect their business. It also comes down to people. Um, I remember I did a lot of work around uh, the sort of internet revolution in the sort of late 1990s. And often there I'd go into a boardroom in a, in a company and people would say, well, do you think I can last out about four or five years without this having a major impact? To which the answer was no with the internet. But you could see what people were doing. They were trying to basically say, can I stay doing exactly what I am for the rest of my career and then I'll, then I'll retire? And I think we do have to remember that people in senior positions in companies Yes, we'll make decisions based on profit for their business, etc. But they're also trying to protect their own careers. And that, unfortunately, is leading, I'm sure, at the moment, many big um, fossil fuel companies to be a little bit um, backwards in their thinking, shall we say. A couple more questions on, on energy now. Um, one comes from Michael Sander. He says, um, will helium-3 affect our society? Well, helium-3 is a potential fuel for, for nuclear fusion. You can, it's emitted by the sun, it's been gathered up on, on the dust on the moon. And if you want to know more about helium-3, um, look at my second ever video on this channel, done almost uh, five years ago, to learn more about helium-3 and also how my videos have changed over, over the last five years. Final energy, we've got a question from Lagondas, 
who asks, um, what do I think could power or fuel a wormhole generator that could squeeze the fabric of gravity, um, uh, etc.? Um, the answer to that is, I've no idea. Maybe a black hole. Um, it's probably a source of energy we haven't discovered yet. But I, I always find it fascinating to think about these long-term futures. I will be doing a video on these, a really amazing um, long-term future ideas, hopefully a bit later in 2013. Right, we're now going to move on to some questions about life extension. I had, had a few of these. Uh, the first of them comes from Orion Dynasty, who asks, when will we start seeing developments in life longevity? Well, I guess the best answer to that is we've already started to see them. Uh, the average human lifespan doubled in the 20th century, from an average of about 35 to at the start of a century to average about 70 at the end. When you say people live an average of 35 years at the start of last century, people go, can't be true. But it is because child mortality was so high. A lot of people died below the age of five. Today, um, I think we're continuing to see that, that, that um, extension in, in most parts of the world. Anyway, a lot, lot fewer children dying at, at a young age, in, in, at least in, in developed nations. Um, it's quite possible that that doubling of life expectancy from, what, 35 to 70 what will double again this century. I'd be pretty certain the first person to live to 140 or more has already been born. It could be you. It probably isn't me. Matt Johnson also asks a question about life extension. who says, with exponential progress in nano, stem, gene and other tech, how long before humans can extend lifespan indefinitely? Um, Indefinitely is a very long time, isn't it? Living forever is, is uh, probably a curse as much as a blessing. Um, I, I, I personally think that very, very long lifespans will not be lived in the human body. They will be lived by people who actually um, upload their consciousness from their head, sticking in the old USB key, sticking into a, a computer or something a bit, the future version of that, and end up either living purely on the internet, purely a life in cyberspace, in, in virtual reality, or potentially moving it into a, a robot body and probably many robot bodies over a period of time. Or you might go back and forth, I suppose. But um, has the first person who lived forever been born? Um, probably not, but you, you never know. It might be someone who gets cryogenically suspended. Um, so it could well be that the first person to live forever has already died. Uh, they're in a cryogenic suspension chamber, and at some point they will be um, woken up again and uh, will then live forever. Final question, sort of related to life extension, is about um, 3D printing. Uh, McVerdy asks, 3D printing is being used to print organs. Could I do a video on those specifics? Well, as some of you know, I've done a video all about um, bioprinting, and in fact it's been used by people who are actually working on real bioprinting all around the world. It's one of those strange things where future studies drives practice and the other other way around. So if you want to see um, more of these bioprinting shots you can see here, just find my, my bioprinting video. Right, this leads us on nicely to um, the final thing I'll talk about today, which is the topic of, of 3D printing. Several of you answered my question about where you think 3D printing will go and what it means. I think Matt Johnson summed up a lot of the, the concern and the debate um, in two points, where he said, firstly, there'll be a big um, piracy issue of physical objects. Anyone could actually print anything out uh, if you've got the right resources and, and Wi-Fi. Um, we've seen clearly um, the music industry, the film industry hit by downloading. The downloading of objects, the mashing of objects is clearly going to become a big issue. And I don't think anybody in the industry um, can really tell you how, how, how that will play out. Um, we've seen recently with Nokia launching the um, design spec for one of its smartphones. So you could actually download those specs, design your own cover and outer casing for the phone and, and put it on the model. That sort of thing will get more and more, more common, but where the intellectual property will lie, we, we can all debate. The second point that, that Matt raised is about unemployment. People will lose their jobs because we won't have so many people needed to produce things. That potentially is true, but it's been said about every technology since the Industrial Revolution. And new technologies tend to result in um, the loss of employment in certain sectors, but new, new types of employment. And some of you picked that up as well. VTOL, Vertical Takeoff and Landing Aircraft, mad. I think 3D printing will not have a net effect on the economy. It will disrupt smaller manufacturing corporations. 
but it'll give a boost to people supplying the materials. And people will just move from manufacturing to design. And I think that that's, I, I would agree with that. It'll just change the balance of things. Um, people who make 3D printers and their suppliers will have a bigger business, um, but we'll just see a shift in where value is created. Um, people went, of course, to Star Trek with 3D printing, or as Musu said, he was a Star Trek fan, or it might be a her, he's a Star Trek fan, but probably not, I guess. They, they thought we'd see the, the, the birth of the replicator. Once we have that, we'll move away from this shameful, barbaric part, part of history. We're doing more interesting things. I'd love to think that that was true. Um, someone asked in, in another question I haven't got before me about abundance and do we have enough resources today and enough technologies for everyone to live a high quality of life? The answer is pro probably yes, but not the way the human race currently allocates resources and fights wars and, and runs things with profit and things like that. But we can hope maybe 3D printing is part of that solution. Finally, a couple of you mentioned food printing, um, McVeady again and Josh McGee. Um, can we have a video here, Chris, they said, on food printing? Well, I'll try and do that. I'm currently writing a book all about 3D printing, which is why I'm not putting up so many videos at the moment. Uh, but once that's finished, maybe I'll do a, a food printing video. Right, so um, that's all the things I'm going to answer today. Um, thank you for everybody who's raised questions, which as you can see I've answered. Um, please do ask some more questions about anything to do with future technologies, challenges, trends, and I'll try and answer them in my next video. Um, I'll also leave you with a question, which is, um, what is the most exciting or frightening future technology um, on the, the known horizon? Please give us your answers on that. We'll have a discussion down in the comments section there. Um, but with that, I will say goodbye for another video, and I hope to talk to you again very soon.